What's up, everyone? It's your host, Chris Vogel, and welcome to another edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast presented by Boot Crew Media and Level Water. Level Water is a New Orleans-based bottled water company providing a sustainable, reliable brand of water that relates to this generation and its ever-growing health-conscious lifestyles. Make sure to go check them out at levelwaterco.com or on Instagram at levelwaterco. Now joining me for this edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast is the one and only Nick Underhill of New Orleans.football. What's going on, Nick? How's your week going? It's going well, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone listening is not subscribed to New Orleans Dot Football yet, I strongly suggest you do so. Some great content, whether it's analytical pieces, breaking news stories. You guys added some podcasts to the family now, which is some great stuff there too. So if you haven't already, go check them out, New Orleans Dot Football. Let's jump into this. You did a really, really fun piece on cornerbacks and where you might find them. And you went through a bunch of situations, whether it's Caleb Farley or Patrick Sertain, JC Horn, a bunch of them. And For you personally, I saw that one of the guys who was popping up in the first round a lot was Caleb Farley, and that's someone that you've talked about a lot on your own personal podcast. I'm just wondering, for people who don't know yet, what's your comfort level with Caleb? Like On the field and tape-wise, I tell everyone, I think his tape is just as good as any corner in this draft, but obviously the back injury is a concern. So for you personally, what would be your level 1 to 10 in terms of comfort if he's there at 28 and the Saints take him? That, that's impossible to say because I don't know anything about the, the medical evaluation. And that's, mm-hmm. really, that's really the whole entire thing with him. You, you just said it. His tape's great. He covers well. He's awesome in press. Um, he shadows guys really well. I think he's physical when he needs to be. He does everything well. Every, everything he does is good. I think he moves well. His back pedal's great. It's just the back. And I don't like the fact that he didn't play last season either just because I feel like there's more development for him. I'm not judging anybody for what, you know, the decisions they made personally about COVID-19 and all that stuff. So if that was the right decision for him, I, I fully support it. I just mean strictly as a football player, isolated from everything else that was happening in the world, which is an impossible thing to do in, in today's world. But, I, you know, I feel like there is a little bit of room for, for growth for him. But getting him at 28 would be really good because I think in a normal situation where he's not injured, he's probably a top 15, 16, 17 pick at the very worst. And that allows him to drop a little bit. Um, I know that there's probably a little bit, bit of discomfort in the fan base about medical evaluations because of some of the stuff that's happened in the bat, past, specifically at cornerback with Keenan Lewis and, and Delvin Bro. But they have changed their process. Bo Lowry leads that department now. Bo's really good at what he does. They had a situation with Ryan Ramchek. They cleared him. They've taken some gambles on some other guys that have medical waivers in their contracts. All that stuff has worked out well. So if they feel comfortable with the player, I think you just kind of got to say, all right, we'll see how this works out. I don't know if they've earned blind trust at this point, but their their track record is leading towards making good medical decisions since, you know, those other fiascos, Jairus Bird and all that other stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm actually gra- uh, like glad you brought up the 2020 season because the one thing that's also impressive, but maybe, like you said, also a little frustrating, the fact that you want to see more is people don't realize Caleb's actually kind of new to the position, which is nuts because he's already that talented. So I, I do agree with you. I, I think it's a, a tricky situation. So I'm going to give you the floor here for a dream scenario. And I'm not going to go dream scenario in the sense that, hey, you know, Justin Fields or Trey Lance falls to like 16 and the Saints trade up and and they get a guy who they think because I think that's the dream scenario for a couple of Saints fans at least that's what I saw after Trey Lance's pro day I saw a bunch of people tweeting about that but what would be your ideal scenario in terms of they stay at 28 who would be that prospect for you that if he's there you're like okay that would be a home run pick for them at that spot well putting Farley aside because we, we don't know what the deal is with, with yeah. his medical realistically, like, I, I don't think JC Horn or anybody like that's going to drop and allow you to trade up or anything like that. So staying at 28, I think the most, the best, most realistic scenario for them would be Greg Newsom. I know that's, that's your guy. Um, you know, I think it addresses a position in need. I think he's pretty good. There's still room for growth there with, with him as well. I think he'll continue to get better. You know, I think he only started 18 games in college. That's my, my little, my little bit of a drawback with him, but you know, I, I think that would be the the perfect scenario for him. Outside of cornerback, let's say somehow that's addressed and it's not going to be. The guy that I like the most in this draft, I think, is uh, I'm going to say his name wrong. The Notre Dame linebacker, Asamu. Say it for me, please. Jeremiah Wusu Kormoa. Yeah, he is. Kormoa, yeah. So, like, Derwin James is probably, like, the favorite, my favorite prospect of all time. Like, I used to watch him at Florida State, like, starting as a freshman just because I liked all the stuff he could do. I kind of see the same thing out of the Notre Dame linebacker. I, I think he can, you know, he covers the slot. He can play safety. He's a good linebacker. I think with the team with the right vision, and I think the Saints are a team that have 
the right vision for that type of player. They already do some of that stuff with, with their safeties and just be expanding it a little bit more. Um, and, you know, you could have him at safety in sub packages, will linebacker and base, I, just all the stuff you could do with him. I, I think he's a dynamic guy. He gives you that sideline to sideline ability that, that you had from Quan Alexander. I think he tackles better than Quan. He's not a great tackler, but he's, he's serviceable as a tackler diagnosis really well. That would probably be my next guy after uh, Newsom. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you brought him up because I actually tweeted about it a couple of weeks ago. I was doing a bunch of mock simulators. I'm like, and every time he falls to 28, I'm just like quickly going and, and picking him. I know it doesn't mean anything because it's just a simulation and it doesn't count, but he's he's a really special talent. I know Saints fans are just going calling him JOK at this point because his name is a mouthful, but he's so talented. I do love uh, what he provides there. And I'm, I'm glad you also brought up linebacker because that kind of brings me to one of my questions I wanted to ask you. I don't know if this is your thought process, but I feel like for most people it is if, if cornerbacks, the primary need going into the draft, what would you say? Second, would you say it's linebacker? Or would you say it's a different position? Yeah, I think it's definitely for me. It's linebacker for, for sure. Just because it, there's so much unknown there after the Mario Davis, like who's, who's the guy that you're the next guy that you're like, Oh, well, he's going to play and he'll be fine. Like there really isn't an answer to that. Um, I know they like chase Hanson a lot. He made the team last year. Uh, he got hurt. Didn't get to do a whole lot. I thought he looked really good in camp, you know, in, Beating out Alex Anzalone isn't necessarily like the greatest accomplishment of all time, but he's probably like a baseline NFL starter. And I thought Chase Hansen had a better camp than him and, and was pushing him throughout camp. So he'll probably continue to get better. We don't know what Zach Bond's going to be right now. Like I'm just looking at him as if, you know, he's, he's on the team and if he gives you something great, if he doesn't, okay. Like I, I have no idea what to expect from him. So yeah, they can add a linebacker and we saw how they, they changed just completely when Quan joined the team. And it's not like Quan's like a top, 15 linebacker in the NFL. He's just, he's a guy with good range. I was explosive, made some plays. If you can get somebody that that's better than him. And I think it's possible. Like, I think you can draft someone that's better than him. That's more range than him. That's, that's just as explosive. I think he can change the, the foundation of the defense considerably. And considering that, you know, the quarterback is, is going to need help from the defense. I think the defense needs to help the quarterback probably. Well, I don't want to say more than ever because that was definitely the case last year, but they need to stay strong on that side of the ball. So if they can get, another linebacker if they strike out at a cornerback in the first round I think that's a great place to go yeah and so you mentioned linebacker I was gonna give you a scenario but I'm gonna give you that a little bit about you putting on the GM hat who would you take in this situation but you brought up Zach Bond and that's someone who I think Saints fans always ask about and there's no actual answer and I know you're not going to be able to give me an actual answer but if you had to guess what would you say is the reason we didn't see him do you think it's the scheme fit do you think it's the not having an offseason for rookie is it the combination what would you say for that yeah, so, I mean, he, he was changing positions. He was more of a pass rusher in college. He was playing off the ball. You know, during camp, I think the thing that, that we saw from him is that it was kind of like, you know, a guy drops back and there's just not that, that you know, there's that click and go with with linebackers. They, they you know, they hit their drop and then immediately they're going. Like with Bonnie, he'd hit his drop and they'd just kind of be like a pause and then he'd go. And he was making the right decisions, but you could see that processing and he's seeing the field from a, from a completely different angle. You know, it's kind of like going from platformer Mario to 3D, 3d world mario where like you know it's just left to right when you're on the line of scrimmage and now you're back in space and you can go all these different directions and he had to process that and i think that was the issue for him and yeah shortened off season didn't help him at all not having preseason games didn't help him at all like you, there really wasn't like that that moment where he could gain their trust either like you know you go into a game and, and if you play really well in these preseason games you're going to get snapped so, like where was he able to prove that it was just practice and obviously he, he didn't make the steps in practice to get on the field the way he needed to but we're going to see. And I think with guys like him, if, if the players aren't showing up for the OTAs, now some of these announcements have been made by teams and there's still guys showing up for OTAs. So we'll see how that plays out. I think he's someone that, that needs OTAs. Cesar Ruiz is someone that could use OTAs. So if they don't, if they don't participate in those, I think those are the guys that are going to hurt a little bit from that. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about Bond was I think when they drafted him, we were all like, oh my God, the value is fantastic because he had a, a, from some analysts had a day one grade. So if he could get on the field, that would be really awesome. So I'm going to go back to that situation I was kind of hinting at. I'm going to put you in this GM spot and I'm going to give you four names that let's say are on the board. What would you do? And the four names at 28 that in my opinion, if this happens, would, would probably be the best players available. Caleb Farley, Terrace Marshall, Kadarius Tony, and Zayvon Collins. What would you do if you were in that situation? And I like all those guys. I, I would probably go with go with Farley just because, again, you have to. The position position of need is, is really high. I really like Kadarius Toney. Um, I think he's someone that could probably fit in really well with this team. And having a big arm quarterback would, would really help him. Um, 
But yeah, I, I have to go cornerback. Anytime you give me a scenario where there's a cornerback available and it's not, you know, we aren't talking about Kelvin Joseph or, or whatever, like in the first round, like I'm yeah. always going to go with the cornerback just because that's that's the spot on the team where I think with all these other players that they they lost, it's like, okay, they can fill that. They'll get depth guys to fill that out. No big deal. This is fine. Manuel Sanders hurts a little bit. I, I don't see that as big of a hole as some other people. I think Mike Thomas coming back healthy um, kind of closes that gap a little bit. So there's a need there, but I don't think it's like a, an absolute, this changes the team if they don't get somebody. Cornerback's the one spot where if they go in with what they have, like I'm looking at my projection, like, okay, they won 11 games, but if they don't have a cornerback, like is it 10, is it nine? Like I, I think it's that big of a deal for them to get that position. So I'm always going the cornerback in every scenario. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably agree with you there. But you, so you mentioned Kadarius Tony, and and you do like him as a prospect, and I don't blame you. He's very interesting. Some people say he has like a, that Alvin Kamara feel to him, where he just makes people miss, and his stop and go is just fantastic. So, if like, where would you rank wide receiver for this team? Because I know you just mentioned Michael Thomas is going to be healthy, or at least that's the assumption. So that's big time for them. And I do agree. I think the Emmanuel Sanders thing, unfortunately, like never clicked when he started getting go, like started getting hot, then COVID hit, and he, you know got in a funk. So. It's tough to tell where would you rank wide receiver among the needs? Because I think now that it's going to be either Winston or Taysom Hill, I feel like they could use another weapon to open up this offense just a bit more. I mean, they are, I know people aren't, you know, soured on the relationship, but Jared Cook's going to be gone now. Like we said, no Sanders. So where would you put wide receiver if you had to rank it among needs? All right. So I've never actually like listed out my, my needs in order. So I'm going to do this right now. Think okay. through. Like, number one's obviously cornerback. I think two's linebacker. I guess three, I would probably go like out of preference I would go pass rusher if you can get a pass rusher I think I you know I think Carl Granderson will, will be good I, I have high hopes for him but you know Marcus Davenport hasn't delivered the way he should like we keep getting fooled by his pressure numbers but his pressures never turn into hits or even sacks or even hits I mean like at some point if you're getting that close you got to start touching the quarterback he's not um Cam Jordan's season last year was weird we'll see what that actually was was it just a weird season and does he bounce back or is he at a point where, you know, he's, he's starting to take a step back? And so I, I think a pass rusher would be number three for me. After that, I guess I would probably go, I guess I, guess I would land me a, a wide receiver at that point. Um, I don't think there's anywhere else where, like interior offensive line is something that I would like to see better, but you're kind of stuck with what you got at this point. Like those, the top three guys that are starting are, are starting. You're good at center, the, the guards, either one. But, you know, there's too much investment there. I don't think anything there is going to change. So... Yeah, at that point, I would go wide receiver is, is the number four need for me. Okay, and and I wonder what would you think about, because this is something that Saints fans have questioned too, the interior of the defensive line. I know you were on the David Onyemata train before he even broke out. Like this was the season where everyone's like, okay, he can be a star at that position. The guy next to him, though, obviously no Rankins, no Malcolm Brown. They do have some interesting options, Shy Tuttle, Malcolm Roach. Are you comfortable with those guys? Do you think they'll have to go back to the defensive tackle well, whether it's undrafted or in, in this draft, whether it's round one through seven? What's your take on the interior of the defensive line? Yeah, so actually I'd put DP above wide receiver. I'd put quarterback above wide receiver too. I'd put okay. quarterback above any position probably except cornerback. But even then, if you you have a quarterback and a cornerback, I'm going the quarterback. So that's that's the exception there. But I don't think they're going to have that opportunity really that early in the draft but yeah I think DT's a, a, a decent need you know I, I do think that if they went in with what they have kind of like wide receiver you'd probably find a way to be okay with it they do a good job of identifying UDFA DTs too um, I don't know if it has to be a super high value position either like you know you get a Tyler Davidson in the fifth round you're, you're fine with that guy next to Anyamata and look the thing with Anyamata too is that very quietly he was when he played on the nose last year he was the most effective nose tackle in the NFL as a pass rusher. I think he had five sacks. Uh, Ojim Bowie, I believe, is is the guy from Cleveland, and he had all his sacks that year. It was in 2018, right, when they played, I think. So he had a bunch of sacks against the Saints that year, but over the last 10 years, outside of that, Larry, I'm so bad at saying this. <laughs> but outside of him, over the last 10 years, Anyamata had the most sacks from the nose. So, I mean, he, he's really turned on in a lot of different ways. Three tech, obviously, he's, he's minted there as, as a high level pass rusher. So, I think he can continue to give you more. But if they can get somebody else alongside him, I, I think you got to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, that's definitely fair. So, I want to go back to cornerback and I want to go through, and this is kind of going back to that article that I talked about before because I thought it was really fascinating going through the simulations and when they need to take a cornerback and who might be available. Let's say these, you know, the in my opinion, this would be one of the worst scenarios. But they, you know, they can't get a Farley, they can't get Newsom, they can't get any of those top guys. 
So it's on to day two when they're looking for a cornerback. Who would be a day two cornerback, at least day two in your mind? I mean, they might go earlier. We don't know. But who's a day two prospect at that position that you have your eye on? You're thinking, okay, I think this guy could be a good fit for the Saints, maybe even a starter for the 2021 season. So we're, we're assuming Melifamu is probably gone. Stokes is probably gone by that point. Sante Samuel's probably gone by that point. So I think you're kind of like in the range of like Kelvin Joseph and Aaron Robinson and, you know, some of those guys. I don't know. I mean, Robinson's a, a slot. Tyson Campbell's probably a reach maybe in the second round. He's probably okay there. So if you can get him, I'm fine with him. I guess I would probably go with Kelvin Joseph just because I, I feel like he has the size and the upside to – to continue to, you know, get better. And, but look, here's the thing. If you're drafting a corner in the second round, like sometimes people get lucky and it's just like picking a 28, a corner. Sometimes you get a Trey white. Most times you don't get a Trey white. So your hopes of getting a starter. That's like amazing from day one at 28 is pretty slim. Like you might get someone that, that's solid and, and you have to do some things that kind of disguise them in the scheme a little bit, but it's probably going to be year two before that guy's, you know, hitting his stride or later in the season. It's 60. Like if you're looking to get a starter at cornerback, you're you're probably you're probably in trouble. Like your pick is your pick 60 cornerbacks, like probably like a fourth round pick at, at wide receiver or a fifth round pick at wide receiver, just because the positional value is so so high. So, you know, I, I think you could probably put Kelvin Joseph on the field, play him a man and and be okay if he has to start doing some zone stuff and they play a lot of zone. Cover four was their their primary coverage last year. Um, you know, they do a lot of cover six. There's a lot of different stuff they do, but you know, if you can hide him a man and, and not have him do a ton of zone stuff, I think you're probably okay. But you know, if you're picking at that point, there, there's some serious limitation with the player you're getting. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a concern for a lot of people. Maybe they do a day two trade up if they were to miss corner at 28. So I think it's definitely fascinating to see what goes down there. So you talked about certain prospects and I'm curious if you have one prospect in your mind who you maybe like more than most people, like for example, I tweet about him, not not too often, but I do tweet about Josh Matterbebe from Illinois because I like his size at wide receiver. I think he's got pretty good speed and his pro day numbers were fantastic. So that's someone who people might see as day three, but I, I like him a little bit more than that. Do you have a prospect personally that you like a lot throughout this process and you feel like isn't getting enough attention? You know, honestly, I don't really know who people talk about because I kind of isolate from draft Twitter because I think there's so much group think that, you know, people just kind of get bullied into opinions and they start yeah. thinking things that really aren't their own thoughts. So I try not to read a whole lot about what other people are saying. Um, so I'll just give you a guy that I like for the saints that I don't think a lot of people probably would just be given what's on the roster. I like the Clemson running back a lot. And if they took him, I would be a hundred percent behind it. Even at 28, I, I just, you know, I know Alvin's on the team. I know Latavius Murray's on the team. If you draft him, I mean, that gives you options cap wise, you know, now all of a sudden is, is Murray someone that you have to keep around for that that money? But also, if you have another running back, I think one of the things that happened to Alvin over the last few years is that his role got kind of pushed back closer to the line of scrimmage and everything he did. Like, he wasn't splitting out as much. He wasn't playing in the slot as much as he was in, in 2017. And I think the reason for that is because, you know, basically, Drew very quickly, one read, two read, not there, whoops, go to Alvin, and, and off you go. Like, if Alvin's down the field or, or, you know, running different routes, that that safety valve wasn't there. So I think they had to change his role to kind of accommodate the quarterback. So with a different quarterback, I think you can open Alvin up more. Now he can play more positions. He can do more. He can, you know, run the receiver routes. If you have another running back and Alvin's in the slot or he's split out, and again, Murray's there, but if you have another option beyond Murray too, you put two running backs on the field, one's in the backfield, you're going to have a mismatch somewhere. Like either they're going to be too soft in the box for the running back or they're going to have the wrong matchup for Alvin. And you can move guys around and do a lot of different things. So I think that, you know, getting another running back on the team would make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, no, and I'm actually glad you brought him up because that's someone who I think it's John Sigler who always he's been tweeting about this since October. He just loves Travis Etienne's game. And I think pairing him with Kamara would be fascinating. And I, I do actually think running back, I'm not saying it's necessarily a need, but if the Saints grabbed one to pair with Kamara, and then like you said, eventually Murray can just He'll be a cap casualty, and it is what it is. But he did give them two really good years already. I think they can absolutely live with that. So you talked about quarterback before. I agree. I don't think they're going to be in a situation where they get one in the first round because, I mean, look, the first three picks are going to be quarterbacks. So by the time the the, the first 10 picks are over, I'm sure Mac will be off the board. Fields, Lance, all of them will be off the board. So 
I'm going to give you a couple of mid round guys. I'm not saying the saints have to take them. I'm just saying either someone's mentioned them or someone said, you know, there's reports about it. So I'll give you Davis mills, Kyle Trask, and I'll throw Kellen Mond in there just because saints fans have been asking. I'm not necessarily high on any of them, but if you had to pick one and let's say you got one in the third round out of all three, which one would you take if you had to take one? Man, I'm, I'm fine with any quarterback they take. I think they should draft a quarterback every single year now going mm -hmm. forward until there is that franchise player. And then even then, I think every couple of years, you should be looking at one. And what's the worst thing that happens? Like either you, you get a really good backup, you get somebody with incredible upside that you can develop and either he pushes your starter, you can trade him or you develop that player and he leaves and you end up getting the draft pick back. And if you strike out, you strike out. It's, you know, it's fine. Like, I think that's a, a spot until you have Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, you should be tapping those waters, you know, any chance you get. I think the thing that's probably more likely for them is for them to find a way to poach one of these guys that gets replaced in the draft. I, I think there's going to be opportunities. We've already seen the carousel spin a little bit, and I think it's going to spin again. And it, at some point, you know, San Francisco, yeah, we aren't trading Jimmy G. Yeah, we'll see about that. Like, th there's going to be opportunities for them, to, I think, to, to get another quarterback. And if you're one of these guys, and let's say you just – you know, straight up get cut or you have some say in where you go to get traded. Uh, like where else would you want to go? Like, I don't think there's a better situation for a quarterback than this one. And, you know, I think they're going to be very, uh, I don't want to use the word active, but I think their eyes are going to wide open to any possibility. You know, Jameis is paid like a backup with upside. So he isn't locked in by any means. I don't think they're, you know, a hundred percent sold on anybody at this point. I think they really like Jameis. But I don't think that they're, you know, fully convinced like, hey, there, there's no need for competition. There's no need to bring anybody else in. I, I think they're still very much uh, looking to see what they can do with that position. Yeah, you talked about it. I believe it was it might have been last week. I can't remember when you talked about it, but being in the quarterback market, what it means for the future and, and things of that sort. And the other name you mentioned, I won't give it away because people should be reading the uh, the cop that you put out there. The other name you mentioned, I thought actually I was more intrigued by in terms of trade. I know Saints fans would probably despise it just because of the rivalry and whatnot. But you mentioned Garoppolo. This is probably my bias coming in and, and it's wrong of me. But so I, I grew up in a household with Niners fans because my, my father and my brother were Niners fans. And just watching him, I'm sure Sean Payton can fix certain things. I just question if he is, like, like look, we don't know what Jameis is, but is he that much of an upgrade over Jameis? And then you have the injury history. I'm just a little scared in that regard, but I do agree. I wouldn't be shocked if there are a couple of quarterbacks that get moved after the draft. And they are, I, I don't, you hinted at it. I think they're trading him. Like, I, I just can't go with the notion that they're going to draft a quarterback at three let Jimmy Garoppolo stay, and then they'll figure it out in camp between a guy who's taken them to the Super Bowl and a guy who they hope leads them to another one. So uh, I think that's a mess. But moving on from that one, I think this is something that it, it could be a way of the Saints just figuring out the comp system, the comp pick system, or it just could be a way of the Saints saying, let's see what we have after the draft. But I wouldn't be shocked if they sign a veteran cornerback, whether it's Sherman or Casey Hayward, maybe someone of that sort. What's your take on that? Do you think Saints fans should be on the look? Because they did something similar with Winston after last year's draft. So what should we kind of expect in that regard? I feel like there has to be like a plan B, a safety net somewhere. There, like there's no way you cut Janoris Jenkins and you don't have another plan. Like they could have restructured and pushed it out and it would have made a $1.5 million difference. You can find that $1.5 million somewhere if you want to. So there's no way they created this hole and it's just like, ah, what do we do? Like it, there has to be, there has to be something out there. Um, but yeah, look, I think it's very possible that they're waiting to see what they do in the draft and then they sign somebody. Um, you know, the situation with Adrian Peterson a few years ago, like they signed Adrian Peterson, they draft Alvin, and then Sean, at some point before they they got rid of Peterson, he basically said like, well, we didn't know who was going to be on the team at that point when we signed him. So I think for, for fairness of the veteran cornerback in the team, I think a lot of these guys are sitting and waiting and they're probably, hey, we'll sign you if we don't get somebody and those guys probably favor that type of situation. So, you know, if you're, if you're Sherman and you sign with the saints and then, you know, they draft Farley or, or Newsom and all of a sudden you aren't playing, like that's a horrible situation for a guy that old, like he just wants to play and, and keep his career going. He doesn't want to watch someone else play. So I, I feel like there has to be something. There's no way that they're going into the season with, you know, Marshawn Lattimore with a cloudy situation over his head and Patrick Robinson and, and kind of hoping for the best. I just, I just don't see that as a, is a possibility. Yeah, definitely. And I'm going to give you one more draft question before I want to get to Jameis, because I know people were really excited about that video that came out on Monday with him, given that, that 
funny speech that he was he was dishing out at a quarterback camp. So I'm going to talk about LSU's Jabril Cox. There was a report about Saints having interest, and they like his athleticism, and rightfully so. I mean, just watching him, he seems like the guy where he needs to fix a lot of things, but the one thing he's really good at is – for me, the hardest thing to coach, and that's linebackers you can cover. And I think he does that extremely well. And we saw with the Saints, they've, they've struggled in that department, at least to get that guy next to DeMario, which you talked about. I don't know if Cox would be able to come in day one and immediately, you know, fill in what Quan was doing for the second half of the regular season. But do you like him as a prospect, maybe around that pick 60 range? And what do you think he could bring to the team? I know LSU fans are all eager to hear about that. Yeah, look, I, I like any corner or cornerback any linebacker that can cover so that's obviously a, a high plus for him um you know the problem is that the Saints aren't allowed to draft LSU players so <laughs> they might as well just move on from this one right away but yeah look there, there's things to clean up um look any, anybody they can bring in at linebacker and add to that position like it's literally zero in my mind next to Demario Davis now again like I said before there might be guys that, that are good and ready to contribute we don't know any of this so Anything they can do there, I, I would be in favor of. Same thing at cornerback. Um, but yeah, look, that explosiveness, I think that's something that, that they need to have at that position. Like Zayvon Collins is someone a lot of people talk about, and I think he does a lot of things really, really well. The one thing he doesn't do, he's not getting sideline to sideline. And I think that that's, you know, we saw how much that helped them last year. Now, am I against Zayvon? No, I'm not. Like, I think he can do a lot of things. He's kind of like a little bit slower, Jamie Collins. They like Jamie Collins a lot. So, you know, I, I see ways that he would fit in but if you could give me an ideal linebacker i'm taking the guy that has the crazy range just especially with the way the league's going and the way they've had trouble covering stuff in the flats and and you know wide receiver screens and guys getting out to the side like if you can have someone that can help clean up on that stuff and and you know have that click and go and get to the sideline it changes your defense and we saw it with Quan. and again Quan isn't a superstar linebacker he's just a really fast guy that had had issues much like you know some of these these guys in the draft um Quan never fixed his tackling. Didn't really matter. He still helped the team a whole lot. So I, I think if you can get someone with that range, you can you can figure out everything else after that. So you mentioned Quan, and I know people are curious just because he brought that energy to the defense that we haven't seen in a while, and it was awesome for the the certain amount of games that he was there and able to stay healthy. Would you take him back, or do you think it would be smart of them if they can, and, and both sides agree to it, just a one-year deal? I know there wouldn't be a lot of money on the table, but it's basically, hey, you get a chance to rebuild your value. We also get a guy who we know fits in our system. Do you think there's still a window open for them to maybe bring back Quan Alexander? I think there's probably a window that was kind of something like right after he got cut. A lot of people are like, you know, I, I think there's a chance he could be back. The question is like, when's he going to be ready? He got hurt really late in the season. And the the key thing for his game is that explosiveness. Like if he can't push off and go, like what is he? So, you know, I, I don't know if he'll be ready this year. If he is and he, and he can show that and he can come back, I, I would, if I were the Saints, I would bring him back. 100 out of 100 times like he was you know just even even as a a presence you know just not even on the field just as a presence on the sideline I, I think he brought energy to the team that they were kind of lacking you know and he's he's kind of a you know a character and brings a little bit of an edge that you know uh cj gardner johnson brings that to the field um having another guy that can bring a little bit of that too i i think is uh you know good for the defense so even just in that aspect i, I think he had a lot of value so if he's uh, if he's good at some point, I would I would 100% bring him back. Okay, yeah, and I, I definitely agree with that sentiment. So let's move to Jameis Winston. He's saying all, all the right things. He looks like he's doing all the right things in terms of training. But again, we don't know until we actually see him on the field in September, week one, and we go from there, and then we hope for the best in that situation. But what's your opinion on Jameis, the, the contract structure, the, the quarterback competition that may happen? If you had to pick today, do you think Jameis is the guy for week one? I think so. Um, look, we saw what Taysom could do, and there's just kind of – there's a cap to it. And he looked really good against the same team twice and then didn't look so good against two other teams. I think that if he had to be your starter, I think Sean could probably find a way to win 10 games with him. I, you know, I don't even really think that's – it's crazy. Like, I think he could probably win 10 games with a lot of guys with the roster they have. And, you know, there, there were just things about him. I Like, I, I've – I now understand why they liked him as much as they did and why they signed him to the contract and why Sean spoke so highly of him. I think when everything was clean for Taysom, he was a lot better than I, I could even imagine as a pocket passer. And I think he made decent decisions. He threw the ball well. He did everything I didn't think he was going to be able to do. And if you're in practice and he's not facing a blitz where he's actually getting hit and stuff and, and things remain relatively clean, you're going to be enticed by all the things he can do. It was when things fell apart 
where it's like, oh, well, Taysom will be really good on the move and all this stuff. Like, that's the stuff he wasn't good at. And it was, it was baffling. So I think Jameis has way more upside. Um, you know, he would have to have a really bad camp, I think, for Taysom to end up as a starter. But the thing for me with Taysom is I, I think that if he's being honest about who he is as a player at his age, if he wants to play and, and be on the field and make an impact consistently, I think a change to H back is, is really what, what he should do. If I were him, I would be like, okay, I want to play. I don't want to sit on the sidelines and watch someone else. I made my run at quarterback. I got paid really well for the potential that I had, but this isn't going to happen for me. I, I would focus on that and just do that and become, you know, he's a good blocker already. Like he runs decent routes. He catches the ball. He's doing all this stuff without practicing at it. Like just if he focused on that, I think he could be a lot better at that role. And I think he's already really good. So I think for the Saints, like as if they're at their best, it would be Jameis a quarterback, assuming Jameis isn't a you know a disaster, which I don't think he'll be a disaster. Um, and Taysom in, in that other role, I think that's how they would be the most you know dynamic and, and best team. Yeah, and you talked about Taysom, and I I totally agree. It was so weird because the things that I thought he would struggle at, he was surprisingly good at. He was really accurate too with the football, which was nice to see. Some good sideline throws and he utilized Michael Thomas extremely well. Michael Thomas had two hundred yard receiving games with him. So there were things that I liked in that regard. And then, like you said, when the pockets collapsing, like the Philly game was just an utter mess with everything going on. You thought he would utilize his speed and he didn't do that, which was just baffling to say the least. So if Jameis Winston has the most to prove on the saints, and I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but he certainly feels that way. He was talking about how he went from a number one pick to people laughing at him. Let's say he has the most to prove in trying to revitalize his career. Who would you say is second on the Saints in terms of they have the most approved? I have someone in mind. I, you might be thinking the same person, but who would you say? I'll give you two and three. And I'm going to probably end up stealing your spec doing two guys and cheating. But I think number one is Marcus Davenport. He's, he's got he's to play a whole lot better. He's got to, you know, I think he's kind of at a crossroads in, in his career, honestly. Like, it's, it's do or die time. It's already been do or die time. But, look, you, you got to figure this out, and you got to start doing more. Beyond that, I think Traquan Smith would be my next guy. I think that... He has a lot more he can do. I, I have this, I'm out on an island on this one, but my personal theory is that I think that in an offense with a bigger arm quarterback that can throw it on the field, he can do a lot more because he's not precise. He's not someone that has, like he struggles with like getting the right splits. And, and you know, if you aren't open immediately coming off the line or look like you're coming open immediately off the line with Breeze, like he's he's not going to look at you because he's he can't hold the ball that long and throw it down the field. Um, So I think, Trey Quan, like if he can get down the field and, and he can be a little bit messy at first, but then get open later, a different quarterback can find him and get him the ball. And uh, we saw that in two games, I think, with Taysom in college. That was kind of the player he was. So I think those are the guys that that I think I have a lot to prove this year outside of I'm not going to name 50 names. I'll let you go. But there's a few other guys that I got in mind. But as, as far as like the more established players, those would be my two. Yeah, no, I the, you hit it immediately with Marcus Davenport. And I, I try to like tiptoe the line because I don't want to be because he seems like such a great guy but like it's it's go time like it needs to happen especially for him we saw what happened with Trey Hendrickson you play well in a contract year you're going to get paid so if he can play well someone will pay him I don't know if we'll be the Saints but someone will pay him and I think for him it's weird because I thought his rookie year although he was raw he had really good moments and I thought that would just continue to build and even when he came back this past season he actually I thought the defensive line changed because of his impact and then it's almost like the end of October came and he was just, he just disappeared. It was so weird. Couldn't figure out what was going on. And, and I, I know he's young, so I'll give him another year, but Ruiz, I think people want to see more out of him. I think we will see more out of him. I actually liked the pick at the time. I was really big on his Michigan tape and I thought he would be great. So when he has to switch to offensive guard and you don't have a full off season, I'm sure that affects him. So those are two guys for me. So my last question for you, I want to go on a positive note for the saints fans out there. If you had to pick, who would be your breakout candidates on both sides of the ball? Give me one for offense, one for defense. Oh, man, this is tough because, like, I feel like a lot of guys are, are already, like, really, really established on this team. Breakout candidate on offense. I'm going to go Deontay Harris just because, look, he can run down the field and now people can throw him the ball down the field. Like, it isn't it isn't as limited. So that would probably be my, my guy on offense. Defense is really tough. I'll go Carl Granderson. I, I think with more snaps with the way he played, the spin moves incredible. Um, he wins in ways that that you know I don't think Trey Hendrickson was was able to win with. He's someone that might actually, you know, at some point demand a double team. So those would be my guys. Yeah, I think Granderson's the perfect pick. I actually I thought you might just continue on the Traquan thing because I, I agree with you. I think Traquan will play better 
with Jameis Winston there, I think it's going to be really interesting. And I remember when I had Amy just on, she was on the call Granderson bandwagon too. So I think he can be a guy that in certain situations can get you eight sacks. I think that would be a pretty good season for him if he could do that. And there's a lot of D line videos coming out of him training. So hopefully that turns into uh, on-field success. So we'll see what happens before I let you go, Nick, can you tell everyone what you've been doing with New Orleans dot football yet? Some really cool announcements. So just to give saints fans an update on what's going on with you. Yeah. So it's my site, me and my wife run it. It's just me and her. Um, it's subscription based. We, we've had a really good first year, which has allowed us to, to start adding some people. Uh, we got a behind the scenes guy. We added a Pelicans podcast. Uh, we just hired an ad salesman this week and we have another writer that that's going to be contributing throughout the year. So, you know, as the site goes, grows, the idea is it's just to kind of reinvest back into it. And we want to just build something kind of through our vision. I feel like we kind of have a, a, feel for what saints fans like and what they want so if people trust us and they support us you know hopefully we can build something that that's in that vision that gives you just exactly what you want without all the other you know garbage and fluff it's just you know right down main line you know in your veins this is the stuff about the saints that 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 people like so that's what we're trying to do um you know it, it's been going well hopefully it keeps going well and you know that's that's it if if you're deep into the details about the team, you know, I, I think the site is, is, is the one for you. Yeah, absolutely. And with draft season coming up, I gotta, I gotta bother you. Will you be unintentionally tipping a pick like Zach Vaughn with last year? Mm, we'll see. We'll okay. See. All right. So that, that should give everyone incentive to go to new Orleans football and check it out if you haven't already, but Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And once again, thank you to everyone listening. I'm going to have another episode out next week, right before the draft. And then after the first round, I'll preview the Saints pick, whether it's at 28, whether they move up. I'm not going to say move back. They don't really do it. But if they do it, all right, I guess I'll have to talk about that too. But I'll have another episode on the Straight Up Saints podcast coming up next Monday.